Good morning. My watch is telling me I moved. That's great. Thank you. Um, I just got a confession to make. Uh, for real, I got a confession to make. I'm really distracted this morning. I'm thinking about the worldly events that are going on. I'm thinking, how can this have happened? And I'm, uh, I'm really torn by it in a lot of different ways. Uh, I hope you are too. I mean, I hope this has rattled you and shaken you. On, on one hand, I hope it does. On the other hand, good grief, what else can we expect? This world is darker this week than it was last week and the week before. I mean, it's just getting darker and darker all the time. All the more reason that I'm going to ask you in these next few minutes to focus because the light has come into the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. And this moment, this moment that we're going to be looking at today, this is the critical moment. This is the moment where Jesus finally reveals the secret that he wants his followers to see. We've been building toward this for a year and a half as we've been studying through the life of Jesus in Mark. You know, we have four Gospels, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Mark is the first one written. Mark is the oldest one, the earliest one. In fact, Matthew and Luke based their Gospels on Mark's outline and verbatim quoted a lot uh, as they are um, writing their Gospels. John came along a little later. He had access to uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he said, well, there's a lot more to tell about Jesus than these stories. And so he kind of tells a whole lot of other stories. And that's why the first three are called the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, they follow the same outline that Mark established. And I think this is really important for you to know. Mark's Gospel is carefully and meticulously structured. I know the way we read it, you know, when we just get a chunk here and a chunk there and a verse here and a verse there, I know it feels like Mark is just a collection of Jesus stories all strung together loosely, and then there's the cross and the resurrection. But that's not what's happening at all. We've been reading this together, and we've seen that Mark is trying to show us something. He's very intentional with the way that he writes, the way that he structures his story. He's got a strategy to it, and his strategy is to convince you of something. So, what if there's one thing? What if there's one thing in the gospel of Mark, one thing that Jesus wants you to see, one thing that Mark wants you to see, the whole reason he wrote this book is for you to get this one idea. What if there's just one idea that, that if you, you miss this, then the cross and the resurrection don't make any sense? What if there's just one thing that, that if you truly get what he's showing you right here, right here in this passage today, that, that all of the pieces fall into place because of this one idea. It's this thing that makes the gospel even comprehensible. Don't you think you'd want to know what that one thing is? So um, Mark tells us this one thing, shows us this one thing, that if we don't get this, if this one thing isn't true, then the whole gospel kind of falls apart. And Jesus would have died a criminal on that cross. And his name would be lost to history, and we would have never heard of him. If not for this one thing. So today, I know we're distracted, but this thing is the thing. This is the important thing. So I'm going to ask you to be with me for just a few minutes as we look in Mark chapter 8 together. Jesus and his disciples have been together for about a year and a half at this point, and Jesus hasn't told them the one thing. 
It's been a year and a half, and he hasn't given him the big key to understanding it all yet. You know the pattern. You've watched it in Mark. Jesus comes on the scene, and he goes from town to town, and he's preaching. He's teaching a lot. He's saying a lot of stuff. We find his thesis, in fact, in Mark chapter 1, where Jesus says his message. The time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near repent of your sins and believe the good news you see that he's teaching about the kingdom of God and he's going around teaching all this but he's not giving the secret away now one thing that we noticed and we looked at it last week was that as Jesus is teaching he's really kind of teaching on two different levels Right? Did you see that last week? He's got shallow level, surface level, that he teaches everybody. The crowd's coming and going, and he's talking in parables. You know, he's kind of speaking in riddles almost. You know, he's just kind of giving them as much, the Bible says, as they can understand. So he's loading them up as much as he can, but then there's a deeper level. Right? He, he's been teaching everybody, and people don't quite get it. Even the disciples don't quite get it. So Jesus brings the disciples. He says, come on, lean in, lean in. I got more for you. I got deeper for you. I got something powerful for you. And he's teaching on two different levels. We saw it a little bit again last week. Jesus teaching the disciples. He says this. He says to them, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Listen and understand. He goes on and he says, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen the more understanding you'll be given. He's saying, come on, guys. I need you to lean in. There's something big here. There's something powerful here that I'm saying, but I'm not really saying. There's something that you ought to be able to figure out if you just read between the lines a little bit. If you just lean in and listen and understanding because the more, under, the more you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. He says, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, but for those who are not listening, what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Jesus is saying, I'm saying it without saying it. I'm showing it. I'm not telling it. And he's not giving him the secret. He wants him to lean in and figure it out on their own. He wants his disciples to get it. There's only one thing he really wants them to see, and he's making the case through a year and a half of ministry. He's not spelling it out for them, but he's showing them in everything that he does. This is Jesus' strategy, and it's Mark's strategy as he writes this story. He's making the case to the reader about Jesus that he wants you to see. Are you leaning in? Are you listening? I mean, are you with Mark on this? Or are you just kind of chilling for an hour on Sunday morning? Jesus is showing us in powerful ways. Literally, over a year and a half, he's showing us in powerful ways with all the healings, healing, 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 casting out, casting out, casting out. It's all these miracles and everything, but then there's this inflection point. Once John the Baptist dies, Jesus turns the volume level of the miracles up to 11, right? He goes from blind people seeing to feeding thousands of people. He goes from sick people healed to walking on water, calming the storm, feeding 4,000 people. I mean, he does this sequence of unbelievable, undeniable miracles. He wants his disciples to see something about himself. Last week we looked at it. He's literally in the boat with them and they don't understand. And he's like, don't you understand yet? You ever looked at your kids and said that? Don't you want, you ever looked at your husband, wives, and say, don't you understand yet? 
So here's Jesus in the boat with them. Don't you understand? And he literally goes, did you see what happened with the feeding of the 5,000? Did you see that? Okay, did you understand that? Did you see what happened with the 4,000? Did you see it? And he says to him again, he says, don't you understand? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Can't you see? Yet he's showing them something that they still haven't seen yet. Then Jesus does something incredible in Bethsaida, which we really looked at intently last week. He heals the blind man, and he does it in that bizarre way. He spits, he grows, spits on the guy's eyes, and then he can see all of a sudden, you know, and, but not really. He can see vaguely. Jesus says, what do you see? And he's like, well, I see people, but they're like trees moving around. He's got this vague tree moving vision. And so Jesus has to touch him again. And then he can see clearly. And I believe, I really believe that Mark put that story right there, right there. So that he's giving us a little bit of foreshadowing into what Jesus is about to do next. Because the disciples have been able to see Jesus. They've seen well enough to follow him. They've given their lives to walk with him and do ministry yet but they still don't understand who he even is yet they've had that vague tree-like faith they know that jesus is powerful authoritative he is a rabbi and he may be you know more powerful than any rabbi we've ever seen but they still haven't put two and two together yet and jesus is about to touch their eyes so that they can see clearly In other words, this is the first blank on your page. Jesus brings sight to the blind. Jesus brings sight to the blind. Oh, I need this so much because we're all spiritually blind. All of us are stumbling around. Man, Jesus just does stuff in my life that's weird. Does he do weird stuff in your life? I mean, do you, do you sometimes wonder why all of a sudden you get those Holy Spirit jitters and he moves you to do something or say something or give something? Do you, I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. This morning, I'm standing back there praying while the music is going on, and I'm just, I'm just saying, God, I don't know why I'm here. I, I'm looking at my message. I'm going, I, I suck at this. I am terrible. And, and Lord, I feel like my heart is most of the time not really even yours. What are you doing? Because you put me here. You've got me here. So, I, God, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can possibly do. But I promise you, God, I got nothing that anybody in the room needs. They don't need me. They need you. I need you. Lord, I just I just... I, I give up. My, I have a script that I wrote out, and I'm throwing it out if you want me to. I just want to be yours. I don't know why God put me here, but he did. And so here I am. I'm just trying to serve him. I'm just trying to honor him. You been there? I don't know why God's put me here, but here I am. I'm yours, Lord. Do what you want with me. And, and a lot of times we don't know what that is, and we feel apprehensive and worried about it, because we are spiritually blind. And right here, it's right here in this passage that we finally find the key to bring this all together. And without this, the life and the story of Jesus makes no sense at all. So Jesus is about to remove the blindness from the disciples. And in order to do that, he does something weird again. He takes them to a place that no good Jewish boy should ever go. So let's pick up the story in Mark 8, 27. Jesus and his disciples, they left Galilee and they went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. All right, so let's break this down. Caesarea Philippi, what even is Caesarea Philippi and why does it matter? Let's just go ahead and look at the map if we can. Uh, Here is the map of the area. You know that Jesus' ministry has mostly been right here around in the Galilee area, around the Sea of Galilee. 
You know, there was that one time where Jesus took his disciples way on up to Tyre and Sidon, and they took several months of a big loop around. Remember that? One of you, thank you. Okay, good. Why do I do, why am I here, God? One, thank you, one. It's all worth it. Okay, good. Oh, me too. <laughs> so mostly, mostly all down here, but once again, they leave Israel. This is Israel here. And they go up to Caesarea Philippi. The original name of Caesarea Philippi is Panias. Um, and it's been renamed that again today. It's called Panias today. Uh, English, it's Benias. So when you go there and you see the signs, they're in several languages. Uh, but Panias starts with a B in English today. I don't know why. Um, it's, it was at the time of Jesus called Caesarea Philippi uh, because it had been fortified and built up a little bit uh, by Philip, who did so in honor of Caesar. So it's Philip's city in honor of Caesar, Caesarea Philippi. Not to be confused with the other one, Caesarea by the sea. And all the people then knew it as Caesarea Philippi, but all the people before Jesus' time knew it as Panias. And all the people after about Jesus' time knew it as Panias. People actually occupied this town all the way up until 1967. And there was a big war that went on over there for the Golan Heights area, and uh, that town was mostly leveled in 67. So uh, it's called Panias for a reason. Let me show you some video. This is what it looks like today. Um, we got to go there uh, a couple of times over the last couple of years. And it's a beautiful place. The headwaters of the Jordan River are there. Uh, at the time of Jesus, that headwater river flew, uh, flowed out of the big cave right here. And uh, you can see the ruins of where they used to conduct all of their pagan worship. There were uh, temples built into the wall of the cliffside right there. Uh, so it was an impressive sight in Jesus' day. In fact, let me show you a picture of what they say it looked like at Jesus' time. See, here's that big cave right here with a big temple over the front of it. Smaller one here. And at the time of Jesus, they're going there. Jesus, the rabbi, and his rabbi disciples are walking up into this place, this place where they should not go because these temples are not godly temples. These are places of demon god worship. Okay, so this is a pagan, awful place. Can you guess which demon god they worshipped there being pan they worship pan hence the name panias and so they worship the evil god pan you know pan he's the goat man that loves to be out in the woods playing his little pan flute right and we kind of see him as a peaceful character out in the woods hanging out you know all that but I did a little research and that is not the legend of Pan that's the way we describe him today but in those days they understood Pan to be an evil demon god of rape and incest and bestiality he was evil evil some of the imagery that you can look up about Pan don't do it right now don't do it right now uh, but you can look it up, and there is some horrible imagery of Pan because he is an evil, evil uh, demon god. And there's stories and all that stuff. But what would happen was you would go here to worship Pan. You would go to the big, the big room, the big room right here. And what you would do is you would go to worship the goat man god. And can you guess what animal Pan wanted you to sacrifice to him? A goat. Starts out as a goat. Because you go there, and here's the deal. The headwaters of the Jordan, at that time, they flowed from the big cave underneath the temple and came out right here. Today, they come out over here because there was an earthquake in about 4 A.D. that shifted everything. Sorry, 40-something 40, 40 A.D. that shifted everything. So uh, the water flows differently now. Uh, later, But at the time, it flowed out of there. And what you would do is you would, you would walk up to the temple with your goat sacrifice. You'd kill the goat there, and you'd throw him in the water in the cave. And if the goat sank in the water, that meant Pan accepted your sacrifice. You had a good sacrifice. Good job. But if your goat floated, 
That means Pan did not accept your sacrifice. That meant your sacrifice wasn't good enough for Pan, and you had to come up with a better sacrifice. You had to level up your sacrifice. And so if goat didn't work, you know what you had to do. Kid. Not baby goat. Baby human. You had to sacrifice a child and throw a dead child in there. So this place, this place, it's horrifying. It's awful. It's terrible. It's dark. It's scary. We get the word panic from pan. We also get the word pandemonium from pan. Pan's a prefix in English, and it actually means something else, but those two words actually come from the root of the name of pan. It's a dark, scary, awful place, and that's where Jesus takes his guys He takes them to this dark, panicky place. In other words, next blank on your page, Caesarea Philippi was the epitome of blindness. He's taking these guys who see vaguely, and he's taking them to a place of utter darkness. And that's, (laughs) that's when Jesus asks the big questions. He asks him two big questions, and you know these questions. They are the critical ones in Mark. Here it is. Ready? In verse 27, as they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? We've been doing this for a year and a half now. What are people saying about me? And in verse 28, well, they replied, well, well. Why do you think they started off with well? Yeah, sometimes I start off with, well, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to deflect. Well, I try to figure out how I'm going to get out of this. Well, I try to figure out how I'm going to worm my way through. I'm not sure yet. Well, they replied, and then here's what their answer was. Some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. And others say you're one of the other prophets. The disciples are kind of hemming and hawing around this issue. You see, here's the thing. I read Mark to you over the past year or so. Is this what people are saying? Maybe. Maybe there's some people that are saying this, some people that are whispering this, but what is the clear implication among the people about Jesus at this time? Could he be something more? Could he be something bigger than even the prophets, than even Elijah, the great prophet? Could he be something better than even John the Baptist? Could he be the chosen one of God? So people were talking, but here's the deal. Jesus wasn't. See, for a year and a half, he'd been teaching about the kingdom of God, and he's been showing them, showing them who he is, but he's not revealing who he is. So it seems like everybody's talking about it. Everyone's buzzing around the corner, uh, in the corners going, hey, could he, could he, have you seen this guy? Have you, do you know what he did? Could he really be? Shush, shush. And everyone's saying it about Jesus, but nobody's daring to say it to Jesus especially the disciples especially the disciples because they're the ones walking with him you know they're the ones hanging with him you know when you got somebody in their downtime and you know their ups and their downs and everything their ends and their some things you just don't talk about and not only that but the disciples are probably scared at this point they're probably a little scared because Jesus has been harsh with them lately Right, the last two or three stories we've read, Jesus has gotten real stern with them. Don't you understand yet? And clearly they don't understand anything. Clearly, even though they've seen Jesus at work time and time again with the volume up to 11, they still don't get it right. So better to just kind of hem and haw than to come out with it. But that's when Jesus hits him right between the eyes. Jesus looks at him and he says to him, but who do you say that I am? Now in my mind, I got a little bit of an imagination, not much. 
But in my mind, this is when it gets real quiet. They've all been like, ooh, 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 the, you know, some, this guy over here said you were John the Baptist. Ooh, this one said you could be Isaiah. This one said you could be Elijah. Maybe you're Moses reincarnated, you know. They're saying different things, but Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? This is the question for you and for me. This is the critical question for all of us. Who do you say Jesus is? And I don't want to hear it. Listen to me, I don't want to hear it. I want to see it. You hear me? I don't want to hear you say it because I know you know the answer. You grew up in Sunday school. You come to church on Sundays. You know the stories well enough to where you can say it all outright. You can probably quote this passage. But I don't want to hear it because I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing it. And I'm aching to see it. I'm tired of Christians blowing smoke and quoting their favorite passages and living like hell all week long. I'm tired of it, aren't you? Doesn't it break your heart? Doesn't it exhaust you and deplete you? Jesus looks right at his disciples right there in that dark, sick, horrific place and he says who do you say that I am you American Christian you're living in a dark sick place you're living in a sick place where we celebrate our pride where we murder unborn children by the generation it seems you're living in a dark sick place where bullets are flying at presidential candidates you're, we're living in a dark sick place who do you say that he is? Because you can say it, I know. But I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something out of you. And that's when we get real quiet. That's when we drop our heads. Don't make eye contact. Don't want to have to answer out loud. Jesus gets harsh sometimes. I don't want to make any waves. I don't want to embarrass myself or anybody else. I'm just going to I'm just going to not make eye contact. Hope he calls on someone else, not me. Oh, look at those rocks right there. <laughs> and I feel like that's how we live our lives. We're in a dark, dark world desperate to see who he really is and we're just keeping our head down. Don't call on me. And in that quiet moment, again, that's my imagination, in that quiet moment, that's when one voice blurts out an answer. And you know who it is. Who is it? It's Peter, who always blurts out an answer, right or wrong. And Peter says it in Mark 8, 29. Peter says, I'll tell you who I say you are. You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Listen, here's the thing. In Mark, nobody has ever uttered this out loud in front of Jesus before. Nobody has said this to him. You definitely get the sense that people are buzzing around the corners about it, but nobody's saying it to him. I wonder if all the other guys in the circle, if their eyes didn't get really big. Dang, he just said it. I can't believe he just went there. Holy cow. I'm not looking. Jesus is going to have fire come from his eyes and strike Peter down right now. He did not just say that. But he calls Jesus the Messiah. You know the Messiah. The Messiah is the one that the Jewish people have been hoping for, dreaming of, praying for, living for, for generation after generation. The promise of the Messiah dates all the way back to Genesis, right after the fall. And so we see all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout Jewish history, there's prophecies about the one, the chosen one of God, sent by God to what? Bring justice to the nations. We think about Messiah, and we think of my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He saves me. Does he save you? That is the way Jesus does it, but what is the promise of the Messiah that he is going to bring justice to the nations? That he's gonna come and conquer everything. He's going to set up the kingdom of God once and for all. 
He's not bringing you peace and you peace and not you peace, but maybe you peace. He's not doing that. He's setting up the kingdom of God. Look at some of the prophecies of the Messiah. Isaiah 42. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring justice to the nations. And then later in Isaiah 61, these are the words of the Messiah. Look, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. So to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. Oh man, festive praise, celebration instead of mourning, beauty instead of ashes, and we take it so for granted. He's promised that despite the world burning around you and turning into ashes, you will be a person of beauty. You will be a nation of priests chosen by God to have the blessing and be the blessing. Peter, next blank on your page, finally saw it. He finally saw it. That Jesus is not just a powerful, spiritual, authoritative rabbi, but that he is God's chosen deliverer of his people, God's own sent one, the one that they had been hoping for and dreaming of. And it's this declaration that Peter makes. This is the declaration that is the breakthrough that Jesus has been building toward for a year and a half. It's this breakthrough moment that changes everything about Jesus' ministry. When you read it in Mark, everything about Jesus changes from this moment on. His language changes, his tone changes, his actions change, his direction changes Miracles completely change. All of his teaching changes. Everything about Jesus and his ministry changes after this one breakthrough moment when they finally wake up and see the light that Jesus is not just a good teacher. They go from vague tree vision of Jesus to seeing him with true clarity. Mark's version of this story kind of ends here and then they pick up with another story. But fortunately... Matthew tells the story almost verbatim, but then gives us a little extra information that you might be expecting here. Here's what happens next. Peter says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus replies in Matthew 16, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Listen, I've been showing you, showing you, showing you, and not telling you. And finally, God has removed the scales from your eyes. He's allowed you to see clearly, and God has given you this clear understanding. And so he says to you that you are Peter. Listen, Jesus does weird things. You know his name wasn't Peter, right? You know his name. What was his name? His name was Simon. It was never Peter until the day Jesus met him. A year and a half earlier, Jesus met him, and it's day one. It's the day Jesus meets Peter. They bring him, and they're like, Simon, this is Jesus. Jesus, this is Simon. And what's the first thing Jesus says to him? Now, I'm not calling you Simon. From now on, you're going to be called Peter. And Simon's going, uh, okay, it's Simon. Um, Weird. Why would you, why would, and what does Peter mean? Come on, let me hear it. What does it mean? It means rock. So he's calling him Rocky for no apparent reason. Uh, Peter's not like Rocky. You know, Adrian. He's not like that. And he's not strong. He's not immovable like a rock. He's back and forth. 
And day one, Jesus gives him this nickname, Rocky, and Peter, no wonder Peter doesn't follow him at first. No wonder it takes a while. It's later when Jesus is in the boat with him and does the miracle with the fish, that's when Peter goes, okay. And you think he would have figured it out then, but it took him a year and a half to get to this moment where he finally figures it out. And he says, Jesus says to him, I'm telling you, your name is Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, this thing you've just said, this confession, this declaration you've just made, upon this rock, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen? Woo, this is a big deal. Now I gotta break this down just a little bit and it's hot up here. Can I get some air conditioning on? Please. Um, I'm working myself up. Yeah, thank you. Um, So let me show you what this, I'm gonna break this down just a little bit because I think this is really important. So I wanna break it down so that you understand what is really happening here because I think our English translations do a pretty mediocre to bad job in this critical moment. So Jesus says this, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Let's look at it one by one. First of all, he says, I will build my church. My church. Um, This is a problem because Jesus didn't really say that. This is a terrible translation. Jesus did not say, I will build my church. The word that we get church from is a German word. It's the word Kirka. And it's a word that was not invented in Jesus' day. It came along hundreds of years later. Kirka means building or edifice. It's a religious word, and it means a building where people go to worship. So the word kirka, the word church, is a religious word, and it means the four walls. But that's not what Jesus said. We get this so backwards. Jesus actually said, when he said this, he says, I will build my, and the word he used was ekklesia. It's a Greek word, and it does not mean building. You see why we get this so backwards. Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia. The definition of ecclesia is not building at all. The definition of ecclesia is right here, ecclesia. He says, uh, uh, ecclesia is a called out gathering of specific people for a purpose, usually a military purpose. Ecclesia is not a religious word. It's a common secular word. And everybody knew what that was. It's a called out gathering. It's certain chosen people. You know, it's you and you and you, not you, 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 not you, you, you. It's, it's certain ones that you're calling out for a reason. I'm calling you out to do something, usually a military something. So think militia. It's kind of like that. That's what ecclesia means. I'm calling you out because we got a job to do. I'm calling you out because we got a purpose we got to accomplish. I'm calling you out because there is a battle to be fought and there's a victory to be won. And so Jesus is saying, I will build my gathering, my called out specific people for a purpose. That's you. You know, we, we get this so backwards. You know, you, you and I hear it all the time. I got to go on Sunday and get me some church. And we think that the way you do that is you go to the church because the church is where God lives. And I'm telling you, that's so bull crap. We get it so backwards. God doesn't live here. This place isn't holy. We talked about it last week. You are the temple. You are the holy people. It's not about a holy building at all anymore. It's about a holy people. You are the body of Christ, the ecclesia. Hello? And so he's called you out. I will build my called out people and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now, you're probably used to this phrase, powers of hell. You're probably used to it from a different translation, a different English translation. What are you used to this saying? The what? The gates of hell. That's closer to what Jesus said. He, he actually said, he said, the gates of Hades. Jesus says the gates of Hades will not conquer it. Okay, so I just want to be clear. Our understanding of hell is not the same thing as their understanding of Hades. It's two different things. For us, hell, well, it's the opposite of heaven. Right? Good people up, bad people down. Right? Peace and happiness and joy and all that stuff in heaven and torture, torment, darkness, isolation, pain, suffering forever in hell. Right? 
right? Two different things. Hades was not like that. Hades was just simply the realm of the dead. There wasn't a distinction between good and bad. It was just that's where the dead people are, are in Hades. And so Jesus says the gates of Hades will not conquer it. Um, yeah, so I look at that, and I, for a long time I was like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because a gate is a defensive thing. It's not an offensive thing. How can a gate conquer anything? And so I thought this was just a weird phrase that Jesus used until I went to Israel and I learned about the gates of Hades. Let's look back at the picture of Caesarea Philippi. This big hole right here is where the big temple was where you sacrificed the goat and threw it in the water. And if the goat didn't work, the child, you know. And the name of this cave is the gates of Hades. So when Jesus is saying the gates of Hades will not conquer it, he's standing at the gates of Hades. And he's saying that this dark, scary, awful thing will not conquer my ecclesia. And so, oops, I think we just lost our signal. Um, the reason that I don't understand the thing about the gates is because I had a wrong understanding about what the gates of Hades were to represent. Uh, let me see the picture of the box. Yeah, so this is my view of what the city gates might look like. You know, it's the city walls with the simple gates. You come in or you go out. And that's the way they were up until right before Jesus. 30 years before Jesus, Herod spent a lot of Roman money to upgrade the gates of all the Israelite walled cities. And they went from a simple gate to a more complex, there it is, more complex gate like this. So instead of just a simple gate, you got two doors, sets of doors with an airlock in between. Now this is important because when Jesus is talking about a gate, this is the type of gate he's thinking of in his mind. And this gate was set up this way because, because imagine this city is facing an invading group of marauders and they want to stop the marauders. Where do you want to stop them? Before they get in to the city. So the marauders come to invade the city. They come all the way up to the gate and you slam these doors closed. The marauders get into the gate and then you slam the other doors closed so they're trapped in the middle. And the thing you don't know about the gate is it's a two-story gate. On the bottom floor, you walk through from gate to gate, but on the top floor, you've got a garrison of soldiers waiting there. And when you slam the two gates, they're trapped below, and then the soldiers attack the invading army and defeat them inside the gate. The gate conquers the invading army. Hello? So Jesus is saying that I will build my ecclesia and the gates of Hades will not conquer it. Well, what he's saying is this is really the gate of Hades. What he's implying here very clearly is that we are the invading army. Do you hear me? What he's saying is that he's called you out, Ecclesia, and you're here for a reason. Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. I am the chosen one. I'm here to restore justice to the nations. I'm here to redeem this world. I'm here to bring light to the darkness, and I need an army, and you're it. You're the invading army, and I'm sending you in. I'm sending you into the city of darkness where you and I live every day. I'm sending you into that city of darkness and the gates will not conquer you. But you will invade that dark city and you will transform it from a city of darkness into a city of light. That's what I'm doing this for. That's who I am and that's who you are. Hello? Because that's what Jesus does to you, right? Isn't that what he did with you? Weren't you spiritually blind in the darkness? Weren't you a traitor, a rebel against God? Didn't you deserve his punishment? But instead, he sent his son to die in your place, to become the sacrifice for your sin. And hasn't he invaded your life now with light, transforming you into a completely different person? Hello, am I talking to a bunch of statues right now? Isn't he changing you? Isn't he making you new? Isn't he bringing the light into your life? Aren't you walking away from all that old darkness, leaving behind all that pain and shame of the mess that you made in your life before and now stepping more and more into his glorious light? And that's what he wants to do in America in the 21st century. That's the reason he's called you out 
The reason he's brought his light into your life is so that you will charge the darkness like an invading army and bring the light into that dark world. We are his answer. He is the Messiah, and we are his army. And that's what we're here for. Do you take it for granted? Do you feel like this is what you get weekly to kind of get recharged, your batteries recharged, so that you can face another week? Or are you attacking another week? Are you stepping into the darkness on behalf of the Messiah and saying, God's chosen you. Come with me because nothing's ever going to be the same in your life anymore. It is awful quiet in here for an invading army. So that's what I'm going to ask. It's the last blank on your page. Do I really understand who he is? Do I really understand who he makes me? Can I see like Peter saw? Do I get it? Or is Jesus and his purpose for me still a vague, dim, moving tree? Oh, I hope you see it. I hope you see it. Our world needs you to see it. Our world is dark and getting darker. Your coworkers need you to see it. Your family needs you to see it. Your neighbors need you to see it because they need the light that comes from the chosen one of God. Let's pray together.